Hi everyone, number one Marmaduke fan here. I saw this cover for a special zine issue of the Unbeatable Squirrel Girl, and I have never bought an issue of the Unbeatable Squirrel Girl or Miss Marvel because I'm spending my own money and I do not purposefully want to expose myself to bad comics if I know they're going to be a bad comics. The bad comics I've bought, they're, I bought them because they were an impulse buy, I was interested in the character and I wanted to check them out, but I've studiously stayed away from comics I knew would make, probably make me cringe. This is the first for me. I'm no longer a purposefully exposing myself to cringe virgin, but the reason why is I saw that they're doing a bit about zines, and it was like I heard this call in my name, number one Marmaduke fan, number one Marmaduke fan, you've got to talk about this. No, not the voices. No, no voices. But anyway, I have done zines. I've done comics for a long time. I've had friends who had, you know, kind of fun, wonky cartoon styles and you've heard me talk in the past one of my videos is squirrel girl could be as awesome as this weird coloring book and i'm talking about these goofy drawings in a coloring book and my point is that bad drawing or childlike drawing can be wonderful and it can be humorous but the problem is the application of that drawing to a kind of story and if you don't know what it is you're trying to do or if you're not committing to the bit then you're going to just end up in this cringy halfway zone where you're neither a great polished action adventure comic with beautiful fluid drawing and you're not kind of a fun edgy goofy comic from the zine fair that's kind of grungy but all kind of charming and how grungy this is this is the ultimate meetup of things not being allowed being allowed to gel together and when i first opened it up i thought that it might have been henderson imitating these styles except for Jim Henson, and then I finally get to the back, and I get to the credits page, so I'm probably going to have to be flipping back to this credits page a lot, which is why I've marked it with another book. But the bit they're doing is the superheroes busted up a library, so they're making an indie zine to raise funds to build the library, so they don't actually credit the artists on the first few pages. You have to get to the back of the comic and then remember who, who did what. I wish they would have credited the artists on the comic that they did and not done this sort of uh, meta, oh, what if all the superheroes made a zine together bit? That's a little unfunny. Okay, so I because they didn't communicate who the artist was, I was kind of guessing the whole time, and I thought maybe it's Erica imitating Styles because there's an Erica-ishness to how Squirrel Girl is drawn. But this one is by Madeline McGrain. And, uh, I've said before I want to do constructive criticism, but I feel like th there has to be a criticism part to that. So if you're one of these artists, hear, hear my heart on this. I don't want to discourage you from doing art, I, I, but I paid five bucks for this comic, and I feel like the opinion of someone who paid money to read your comic should count for something. So I, I, and I, I think it's perfectly fair to roast you a little bit, a little bit. But I love you guys. Keep keep making art. But now let's dive into it. Okay, so Melissa McGrain. She's done. I, I have actually collected Melissa McGrain's work before. I've met. I think I met her at a zine festival, and may may still have it somewhere. But you know, like you buy a little twenty five cent zine, and you know, who cares if it there's the drawings a little wonky in pla places? You paid twenty five cents for it, and notice how this vampire has kind of just a sort of charming, sweet simplicity to it. Well, there's a little bit of that charming, sweet simplicity in how kind of the mugger is drawn, but it, it seems as if she's trying to imitate Erica Henderson's wonkiness for Squirrel Girl. And what we get is a weird psycho serial killer Squirrel Girl on every page. So it, the, I, I actually blame more than the artist. I blame uh, Ryan North primarily for how terribly unfunny this whole comic was. This was a failure of the script and of not matching the tone to the script. So if someone has a wonky style with their art and you ask them, tell me a funny story, they probably can because I think that artists have kind of a sense within themselves of what sense of humor works with their style of drawing, where a webcomic with goofy little chibi characters can work depending on the style, the sense of humor. But certain styles of art don't lend themselves to certain styles of humor. And, and I think Ryan North's style of humor is non-humor. The joke is this punk stole the Mona Lisa and brought it to New York, and Squirrel Girl caught him. Tee hee, isn't it funny that he stole the Mona Lisa? That's so silly. But they, it's paragraphs of text that tell us he stole the 
Mona Lisa and Teehee, he stole the Mona Lisa. Oh, show me him stealing the Mona Lisa or something. So the page I'm going to skip is the title page, which has all the pretend credits for the Marvel characters, uh, because I want to, every comic gives me something to talk about and I need to touch on them a little bit. So that's going to be the page I skip. But what I'll say about that dumb title page is that pretty much spoils every joke from you for then on. If you read the title page and you say, oh, Craven the Hunter did a comic and Spider-Man did a comic, you've already had every joke, joke spoiled for you because all of these comics are essentially one note, one joke stories. And the, the, if they're not funny, if they're not funny on the title page where you can summarize the joke to the title, they're not funny within the context of the comic themselves because the, go, the, gag, the gag's already been spoiled. It's not funny the second time or the third time if it wasn't funny the first time. Okay. You have seen some anti comics gate people uh, contend that Squirrel Girl has a wacky sense of humor that a gr little kids age you know eight to eleven just love. So uh, any any little eight to eleven year old girls in the off in the audience, I would love to know: Is this your sense of humor? Do you like? Uh, references to Sam Spade detective movies from the 1930s combined with a uh, French a, a, a woman French kissing a duck. Tee hee oh it's it's like bestiality. Oh man, little 10-year-old girls, they just love the bestiality jokes. Ooh, Chip. Wait a second. Who wrote this? Erica or Chip Sidarsky? Okay, I got to check the credits. It, this was a Chip Sidarsky Erica Henderson collab. Erica Henderson wrote this. Chip Zdarsky drew it. Okay. Erica Henderson has a disturbed mind. And, okay, and then they do like a bit like, oh, uh, mail, the, mail the rest of the story to someone, teehee, because there'll be indie zines that, you know, they'll tell you, hey, take this, rip this card out and mail it to someone. There'll be like a, you participate in, uh, you know, how the, the, the story of the zine getting finished or you send the goofy drawing to a friend of yours to have a laugh. But it doesn't work in a polished Marvel comic on this pristine paper with all this professional coloring. You are not evoking the sensibility of kind of grungy, you know, marker it out on a little sheet of paper and then photocopy it and uh, staple it together, you know, at there at the table and sell it to 25 for, for 25 cent aesthetic of, of zine culture. You're, you're poking fun of zine culture. You're assuming that your audience has gone to zine fests and knows what zine culture is, but this isn't zine culture. It's, it's faux zine culture. And also, even when we do a bit making fun of old, uh, what do you call them? Femme fatales, and they give them some curves to evoke that idea. Well, it still has to meet the PC post Hawkeye Hawkeye initiative definition of how to draw a woman. So you can't even draw like an exaggerated female body for the purpose of humor in a bit that's making fun of goofy old uh, hard-boiled detective stories of, of yore. Okay, so that was drawn by Chip, written by Erica. So that was the only one that was written by someone other than uh, Ryan North. So the rest were, when we talk about the writer, we're going to talk about Ryan North. This one about brain drain was drawn by Tom Fowler. And I didn't know too much about Tom Fowler. So I don't know, I can't comment on the history of any of these other people. The only one I really knew was Madeline before reading this. But I think Tom Fowler actually has a fun drawing style where... Uh, brain drain will make, you know, uh, exaggerated gestures and, you know, he'll point at his skull and that that's kind of a funny drawing all by itself. So he's putting some character and some body language into this goofy villain. So, uh, I, I dug that if I wrote my own words in my head, I could probably find this amusing, but I think the failure of this is once again, Ryan North beating a joke to death and, not having a sense for either either what is funny in the first place, or if he knows what's funny, how to package what's funny. Think think of comedians. So many comedians tell the same kind of joke, you know, like, but a, a, a lot of them will tell a story about something that happened to them, and they'll play it up, right? But if you summarized what happened to them in the point of bullet points, that wouldn't be funny. It's their delivery. Or if it's a joke that's like a pun or a play on words, they won't just... Uh, they won't repeat it over and over again. They'll, something about their delivery adds to what's the qualities of the joke that make it funny. It, you can't separate the two of them. So I don't know. The problem with this is essentially the gag could be summarized as 
brain uh, brain drain uh, is sort of inhuman and wants to cheer up people, but he has a bleak and nihilist view of the world. But the way this comes across, it feels it feels more like Ryan North has the nihilist view of the wor- world. And should I be worried? Should I be worried about Ryan North? Are you okay, buddy? You can you can call me. You can talk to me on Twitter anytime, Ryan. Okay. Okay, if you're feeling down, hit me up. I'll talk to you about Jesus. We'll have a nice long talk. Ah, oh, okay. Cats and, no oh, puppies. That'll make you funny. Look at this. Okay, so he's, this is the gag, right? Nihilism, but dressed up in pretty rainbows. That's, that's the funny combination. But it's in the form of four paragraphs of, four boxes with about six paragraphs of text that are all essentially tee hee, life is meaningless, that's the joke, and I hope you thought it was funny the first time, because it's now it's got to be funny the second through sixth time. Parallel, uh, there, there is only one you. Parallel universes, notwithstanding, you are loved. I program myself with baseline affection for all humans. Okay, on everyone makes mistakes. On a galactic time scale, they are soon forgotten, just as even humanity's greatest greatest triumphs will one day be lost in a cold and silent universe. Yes, in a naturalist materialist universe without a God, the 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 universe will cave in on itself, the sun will explode, earth will die, all any other planets on there that may have life, they'll all die too. And even this comic, and how horrendous this comic is, will blissfully be forgotten from the history of the universe and it, it, as it's vacuumed into sweet, sweet nothingness. Or you're just going to have to explain to Jesus how the heck you wrote this pile of nonsense. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, any value judgment is made in the content context of human morality, a fragile and fallible construct in a universe devoid of objective truth. A while ago, someone made a great comment on my Punisher of the Platoon video where they pointed out that I was kind of getting upset about the politics of it, but they made the point that some of that might be because Vietnam vets were conscripted, so they might not have the same perspective as volunteers, and some of that might have been the communist character's words, not the author's words and opinions, and I, I highlighted that comment. I think I did. I should have put like a heart on it, and if I didn't, I'll go back and do that, because that was a really good comment, and that got me thinking about being careful not to instantly assume that what's said in the comic represents the writer's point of view or the writer's words. But this is really dreary stuff. And it's possible that North doesn't believe this is true, and he's just putting this in here for the gag of teehee, nihilism plus rainbows. But, man, seeing that in the in a Marvel comic targeting kids, allegedly, according to the anti-comics gate crowd. This is the stuff kids just love. They can't get enough of this. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Squirrel Girl. Yep, put them right next to each other on your shelf. I'm Okay, so even though it's possible that this isn't Ryan North's real view of the world, he's just doing a bit, part of me wonders whether this is telling us something about I don't know, Ryan North's sadness or life of emptiness without a feel of purpose in the universe because we're all spiraling towards nothing in a purposeless, uncreated universe. I don't know. Uh, But uh, this is one of the few where I consistently enjoyed the drawing. Oh, try to skip more. Okay. This is a bit like of doing like, oh, spiral, and then, oh, read it backwards. You, You know those cringy Facebook posts where it's like something like cancer? Cancer will not be the... But, and then and then you get to the bottom and it's like and then I die and then it, you get to the bottom and then you read it upside down and it's die cancer you you cancer will not defeat me yeah, but oh, if you wanted to do a bit making fun of how gorky those poems are I guess but this feels like the person Brian North sincerely loves those poems and can't get enough I don't know about the art style I mean just bright rainbow colors throughout all the chroma all the way up mm, little bit let let loki pop a bit more uh loki's kind of got sort of that sort of sweet bishy boy anime uh, uh pr- probably you've probably read a few fan fictions about him if you catch my drift sort of sort of presentation but i, I don't have too many complaints about it it's just it's a cutesy boy floating in front of empty space for all of it so hard to mess that up so uh, I don't have, that one would be Carla McNeil. I don't have too much shade 
to throw on that. I do have shade to throw on this. You read this and you come down. Take two, guys. I like my first take enough that I want to keep it, and I ran out of storage. So I was talking about how you read these words and come down, but you're actually supposed to follow the spiral this way. Therefore, when you start to read it, this is counterintuitive to instructing you in the way you're supposed to read this comic in a spiral going this way, and this leading into this adds to that confusion. So that's a compositional problem for a pretty straightforward one-note gag comic. Mm. Uh, and then uh, the joke here is that Craven the Hunter is telling lies about Spider-Man, and Spider -Man, he thinks Spider-Man's a doofus, and he thinks he is awesome, and he's got little cutesy shoes. Okay, whatever. And then this was not credited. This was credited to Raza, and it's a little kitty with a mustache. So I'm guessing this means that this would have been Erica Henderson who made this. I have seen much better stick figures than this. When a person says, I can't even draw a stick figure, I say, yeah, stick figures are hard to draw, and they're easy to mess up. So why don't you draw a, per, why, why not draw like a, a bunch of shapes? You can draw those. Those are much easier to draw than stick figures. So they're, these aren't quite stick figures, and they, they aren't quite like simple shape characters. But, you know, XKCD uses stick figures, and you can make it work based on the tone of the story. This is cringy, and the color, you know, the professional color doesn't match up with the, oh, teehee, I ripped out a sheet of paper from my notebook vibe. No, nothing ha contributes to a cohesive vibe. So we've got, it's not Alex Ross, but it's kind of like Alex Ross, that hyper-realistic painting style in a photo on top. So that's communicating to us, oh, this is Marvel Comics. They have hyper-realistic artists who they can call upon. And this is like, oh, teehee, we're pretending to be down to earth and folksy and grungy and doodling in our notebook paper. But the, even the lettering doesn't uh, add to that. Hand draw the letters to, to evoke that feel. And the joke is, Spider-Man is a jagoff. And yeah, I'm not big on T let's all laugh at Spider-Man and how pathetic he is. This one's an interesting one. So I, I, once again, I think the failure is on Ryan North for delivering a story that uh, connects with the art. This one is by, the art is by Anders N Nilsson. And it reminds me of R. Crumb. I'm sure he gets that a lot because it's sort of that rough, grungy, underground style with like lots of extra little lines and dots to make it look, kind of give it a grungy feel. And it's kind of a, it's kind of, I'd call it like a purposefully ugly drawing style. And the only, I, I, I'm just going to say, I think this drawing style is ugly. The only caveat I give is there could be stories where an ugly drawing style lends itself to the tone of the work. If you're doing a story about abuse you experience from a bully when you were a kid. A drawing style that's ugly might lend itself to the ugly subject matter of the story you're telling. This, there's a disharmony between the story they're trying to tell and then what ends up happening is it feels like, oh, this is just sort of like a generic, sweet Marvel story set in the Marvel universe, but with just an ugly style tacked on. And Wolverine's talking to this sentinel who claims that he has been lying defeated for decades. And in that time, he has overcome his hatred of mutants. And if if Wolverine will only trust him, then the sentinel will help him save the world from all these monsters. Well, fridge logic, what, what threat is there to the universe that Wolverine in a sentinel suit can can handle that Wolverine couldn't handle all by himself. What about all these characters who, I, I mean, he's, he's hard to kill, but there are characters who can blast away more stuff than Wolverine with, you know, supercharged beams or whatever. So it's kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird setup. And the, 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 st the tone of the story is essentially, oh, Wolverine, you hate Sentinels. Aren't you just being like those bigots against mutants by hating Sentinels? You don't know me. Well, he knows that this Sentinel fought and tried to kill the X-Men before, and it's very easy to lie in this situation. So Wolverine actually has a very good reason to be suspicious and not trust a Sentinel in, in this scenario. So the love and tolerance message kind of wah wah falls flat because that loving and tolerating the Sentinel in this situation isn't actually that smart. And, oh, these claws. So I've sometimes seen... Wolverine's claws elongated for artistic effect, but this is almost like the length of short swords. And if we look here, let's get it to focus. Okay, there's the length of the claws. There's the length of his arms. He, he should have these claws coming out the back of his elbow 
ugh. And, you know, doing elongating them for artistic effect isn't going to make us overlook things like that. And then there's, you know, kind of like grungy things like line, you know, parts of the drawing over the words that makes parts of it harder to read. This, ha this has the sincere grungy feel of an underground artist. And since I didn't know who was doing what when I first read this, this is where I started to put two and two together that this isn't Erica m mimicking all these styles. There have to be other artists at work here, but I'm ever going to find out who they are. All right, this is the colorist for uh, Squirrel Girl. So she doesn't get like a special little bio, but uh, Rico Renzi. So Rico Renzi is a colorist. I think there's good color sensibility in that, you know, solid, simple colors are selected, but the colors that are selected actually kind of flatten everything to like a paper craft feel. And sometimes Bat Squirrel here doesn't pop forward that much. Sometimes things don't separate that well, especially without the drawing line that would usually help you separate things like the character from the background. And once again, Ryan North. Okay, so the joke is, oh, it, it's this squirrel, Tippy Toe the Squirrel she wants to be Batman. She's Bat Squirrel. She tells the story of her origin, but actually her parents really didn't die in an alley. Huh. And it's joke in the form of text. So earlier when we saw Brain Drain, I said that the, the, the drawings of Brain Drain were kind of funny all by themselves. He's, you know, he's doing, he's doing a funny walk. He's doing some funny, you know, pu pushing the screen board in. He's coming back and pointing. The, the gestures are amusing. Uh, so what I was trying to point out is art can help sell it. This looks like it could just be like a cute little, you know, kid story for four-year-olds. It doesn't necessarily look funny. And the gags are all within the dialogue. Nothing within the pictures. If you read the pictures without the gag would cue you to, ha ha, these guys are so funny. It, it's cute. It's kind of cute and charming, but it's not funny drawing. And the gags in the text are bad and neither work together or, or save itself. I didn't laugh once while reading this because it was obvious what the, jo the jokes were going to be a as I read. But an actual charming, when I've talked about committing to the bit of, have, of having a kid style, if you're just going to go for little kids, then yeah, this kind of professional children's book illustration style might be a route. I'm not so big on the photo montage thing because then you've got this weird like photographic nut contrasting with the simple beautiful shapes and colors of this and I do like contain it keeping the outline of the black and white line drawing so that you have something to read so that you have you know eyes and heads and arms that you can identify quickly without just trying to color separate it. Let let the kids who are color blind be able to read your charming children's story too. So this the funniest part of this whole Squirrel Girl comic was the Jim Henson Garfield bit. And to do it, Ryan North essentially just copied old Jim Henson gags and put them into the mouths of my boy Norrin Rad. He, he, he's on Twitter, and the problem is there are like a million Norrin Rads on Twitter, so he's got like a big long number after his name at, that I don't have memorized. But my boy Norrin, here you are, bud. Oh well, boy, this is this is even better than Dan Slott's Silver Surfer. But I actually dig this. It's been cool to hate on Garfield recently, and I get that the, the gags have kind of gotten old in Garfield. I think it's overstated its welcome by about a good decade or so. But when I was a kid, I laughed at Garfield, and I still thought Garfield was funny when I was a teenager, especially the old ones, because I think that Jim, uh, Jim Henson, no, Jim Davis, who's Jim Henson? Oh, Jim Henson's the puppet guy. Jim Davis. I think Jim Davis has a good feel for tertiary humor. He's done one thing for 40 plus years, set up, uh, introduction, set up, punchline, introduction, set up, punchline. And this, it's like Garfield minus Garfield, because the joke is, if you know Garfield, then you kind of get that, oh, okay, this is like a bit about how silly Garfield is. This is, this is word for word, the very first Garfield comic strip, Feed Me, but with, uh, with Silver Surfer for Uncle, for John Arbuckle, and Galactus for Garfield, and just like Garfield eats too much, Galactus eats too much, and I recognized about half of these gags from the history of Garfield. I laughed out loud while reading some of these, but it's still kind of teehee Garfield humor, which, ah, uh, man. Okay, but this was my laugh. Thank you, thank you, Jim Davis, for giving me one laugh in the entire Squirrel Girl zine collection. I'm going to try a bit 
I'm going to save this comic in my collection until the day before this code expires. And if anyone on planet Earth would like the digital code for this comic, either comment here on YouTube or on Twitter, and you may have this. I don't care if you're a social justice warrior or a feminist or whatever. You may have the code for this comic. If you're willing to go enter it in manually into the code redemption thing on marvel.com, this digital comic can be yours. Will Will anyone redeem it before the expiration date? I don't know. On the day before the expiration date, I'm going to mark my calendar, and then I'll redeem it right before it expires. But until then, this one's up for grabs. Lazy, but... Photo comic. Tee hee, aren't photo comics so funny that you see in zines? Well, photo comics I see in zines don't look this po pol have this polished art in them, but they also uh ugh. Are you making fun of zines? Are you saying tee hee zines are lazy? Let's all laugh at how bad zine culture is, or are you trying to convince zine culture people to buy this comic and say tee hee, it's just like my zine? Uh, uh. Raza did this one again, the cat, which me, I think means Erica Henderson with someone else. And then back to the end. And here I'd like to present to you, sincerely, what I consider to be the finest drawing of Squirrel Girl I have seen in the entire run of the Squirrel Girl comic. This shows charm. This shows ex excellence. Like I said, the first time I read this, I thought, oh, is this Erica like making fun of kids and trying to imitate a kid's style? This is the work of a real young person who has charming potential that I want to see her develop and continue to and continue to grow as an artist and a person. Thank you. The, the artist's name is... Oops. Oops. The artist's name is Iris Hold, Holdren. Iris Holdren, thank you for giving me a beautiful drawing of Squirrel Girl in this comic. You should be proud of yourself. I'm happy for you. Keep drawing. This is wonderful. The best drawing of Squirrel Girl in this entire comic and in the whole run of the Squirrel Girl comic. I'm number one Marmaduke fan. Love you guys. Why don't you like, comment, and subscribe, and I will catch you later.